Okay, uh, we'll try uh, again, uh, uh, this time with a microphone. So, uh, uh, the third speaker of this morning is uh, Omer Reingold from Stanford. He uh, still has uh, major contributions in uh, uh, pseudorandomness, uh, derandomization, in cryptography. And, uh, uh, and uh, as I said, he, uh, he received several uh, uh, prestigious awards, including the Gedel Prize, uh, which is a strict uh, requirement for uh, everybody in this uh, morning uh, session. And uh, uh, the title of uh, his lecture today is uh, Computer Science Foundations of Algorithmic Fairness. me uh, but uh, and there is a place for all of you to join us for because there are tons of interesting problems in this so one thing I can say about the future is that in June we're going to have the first conf <laughs> sure I'm so June uh, we're going to have the first meeting of a new conference on the foundation of responsible computing, essentially everything, kind of the theory sub area that works on, on computation and society, everything that we can think of now, like privacy and, and fairness, and everything that we'll care about in the future. And uh, we want a home for this sub community and this conference that will start this June is going hopefully to be this uh, home for an area that I believe is really important for the prosperity of computer science. Um, so, yeah, algorithms are making decisions or informing decisions that are pretty important for individuals. And when, when algorithms are making decisions, uh, we're trying to hold them to, to the same standards of every decision makers. And uh, there are various concerns that we should care about. The concern that we'll care about in this, con in this talk is uh, whether algorithms are discriminating. And discriminating against subpopulations that are perhaps protected by, by law or by uh, ethics. Um, and the question, the first question is perhaps everything will be done automatically by just employing algorithms, perhaps algorithms being kind of these objective creatures will not uh, uh, discriminate anymore. And, and this hope, this naive hope, uh, of course, uh, has been shown in practice again and again not to hold. So algorithms, just by themselves, uh, will uh, or have the capacity of actually even, uh, well, definitely uh, uh, propagating, but even amplifying biases that exist in our society for various reasons. And we cannot just say, okay, let machine learning be machine learning, let optimization be optimization and run its course because the question is what are we optimizing? It's not enough to learn and optimize. And, uh, and then in this arena, the question is, what can we do? What can we do as theoreticians? What can we do as computer scientists? Because fairness uh, was not invented by computer scientists. This is an area that, that other disciplines have been working on for uh, generations. And the question is, to what extent does computer science, uh, or what kind of role can computer science play in this? 
Uh, and there has been a lot of interest, definitely in the last decade, by computer scientists in algorithmic fairness. And kind of one answer is that as this problem, of, problem of discrimination has existed always, but at this point, the scale of discrimination by algorithms, by big data is so huge. And since we are part of the problem, we should be part of the solution. And there are some things that we know how to do or can contribute in a way that other disciplines uh, are just not trained to do. Well, we should be the ones that provide new models, definitions, algorithms, and sometimes we'll have solutions that cannot come about uh, from a different discipline. And some of the work that I'll talk about here is very uh, computational in nature. On the other hand, we cannot do it by ourselves. This is kind of a very multidisciplinary uh, research area, which means that we spend a lot of time talking with people from other communities. And this turns out to be very difficult. And so Shafi talked about uh, different in language, and that's part of it. But you also experience different in values uh, by different communities. In particular, when you meet other communities, you can see at times a lot of suspicion about some of the things that we hold very dear, like math, like science. Uh, so, and, and the first reaction is, what do you mean? Uh, but when you kind of see why is this suspicion coming about, there are very good reasons for these communities to be suspicious about math and science because of the, the way it was used uh, in the past. Somehow there is a bridge that needs to be crossed and, uh, and in this bridge it needed to translate some of the things, for example, that Shavi was talking about general principles in English uh, to something that we can train our algorithms to be consistent with. Within computer science, the question is what in theory do? And theory has been playing a major role uh, in this area since it became, uh, and actually helped make it as exciting as it is today. Uh, I will just say that even within computer science, within theory, We've been talking about different kinds of fairness for a while. There are diff different kinds of disciplines. Uh, so, for example, for scheduling or envy freeness, a cutting. Uh, there is something a little bit different in the kind of fairness that I'll be talking about today than, uh, than these, uh, this, these kind of areas. Uh, but there may be a need to combine some of it. So, we are actually revisiting some of those things now again from the perspective of new algorithmic fairness. And this area is growing in sophistication, in depth, evolving a lot of other areas. And I'll try to hint about some of the ways in which different areas like uh, cryptography, uh, complexity theory, uh, game theory play a role uh, uh, in, this, in this area. So whatever kind of theory you care about. It has a room in the work on algorithmic fairness and uh, everybody's invited to this very exciting new area within, within theory. So uh, some, some of the major themes that are going on in the research, and I'll focus a lot about this, the first theme, which is beyond group fairness, and I'll explain what it is. But since I, I do want to talk a, a little bit about the future, towards the end I'll kind of go over this list of different areas that we care about and say a little bit about the kind of considerations that we want to address and to some extent already now, to some extent in the future, and then Muli will be happy that I delivered. Okay, so let's start with this uh, beyond uh, group fairness and then yeah, towards the end, we'll see how we are extending our knowledge in, every, in many other ways beyond what's known today, beyond what's addressed today. And for the sake of this talk, I want to concentrate on, on one aspect. So 
whatever algorithms are doing, we can ask, okay, do this thing with, uh, with fairness, uh, or don't discriminate while doing this thing. And the one thing that I'm going to concentrate mostly that algorithms do is uh, coming up with risk scores. So it turns out that when we're going out into this world, we are measured by algorithms uh, all the time. So algorithms are trying to understand what's the probability that we are going to click on an ad or to click on a news ad article, sometimes what's the probability of a major health problem in the next 10 years, uh, what's the probability that we are going to repay a loan. And this is the kind of thing that algorithms are doing that we'll try to address uh, in this talk. Again, one of the beyond things that I promised to you is beyond this kind of decision. So uh, to look at other things that algorithms are doing. But this is going to be the task that algorithms are doing that will ask, okay, when they're doing that, how can they discriminate less or, or not discriminate? What would it mean? The question is, when, when we're having all of these things, these algorithms are trying to predict some probabilities of some event for an individual. So they're trying to predict individual probabilities, and the question is, what does these probabilities even mean? So these algorithms are supposed to do something, but it's not completely clear what is it that they're going to do. After all, uh, if, something, if I'm going to click or not click on this, on this ad, I'm just one individual, and this is just one event, what's the probability space for which we are calculating this probability of this event? And there are various answers, uh, various philosophic approaches to that. Somehow it kind of tries to perhaps capture this notion of probability, to capture some kind of probability in the environment, uh, or some limited information that we may have uh, about the individual. But there is not a clear answer. There are various answers, and it has been debated uh, for many years. And we, as computer scientists, don't have necessarily a different answer that, than the ones before. It's not completely clear what these probabilities mean. Let's kind of think about it through an example. So you go to your doctor. And, and they tell you that you have some probability of uh, developing some condition. So they say 0 0.4. And, and you ask, okay, what does this mean? They tell you, you know, there was a study with individuals that have a profile similar to yours, and 0 0.4 of them developed this condition in, the, in yeah, one year. You go home and you Google it. And you find a different study that also capture people like you. And now uh, these people develop it with probability that's 0 0.7. So you're kind of getting even more worried and you don't know which ones you should believe. Uh, but actually what happens if you find a different study and this different study doesn't say 0 0.7, it says 0 0.4. Should now you, you can, this reconfirms what you heard from your physician, or perhaps you are now subject to two different risk uh, factors, and your probability is actually higher. You are the cause of this 0 0.4. In. And even a study that doesn't capture your information um, may affect you. So perhaps this 0 0.7 uh, study says that actually your probability is a, v, a bit lower. So we'll ask, how can you capture everything that you know, all these studies, and come up with something? So some of the approaches I'll talk about, something that's consistent with all the data in front of you. There's really a, a serious question of what does it mean? What are those individual probabilities actually even mean? If we don't know what they mean, can we at least provide them with some notion of fairness? And, and this is where we cannot expect a single definition. In fact, for any of the things that I want to capture in this new conference that have to do with computation society, we don't expect a single 
a single definition. And here too, because fairness is context dependent and depends on social norms. So if it's computation and society, society needs to have its word and say, what do they want? What does society want out of this fairness? We don't expect a single definition. There is really very subtle ways of discriminating. It's a very nice game to play with. You take a definition of fairness or definition that presents some kind of discrimination, and you see how to abuse it, and we've been playing it for a while. Uh, but it's not even in the situation where you know it when you see it. Some cases were debated. You see a case and you say, okay, this is what the algorithm is doing. Now we can argue, is it fair, isn't it fair? In this state of affair, A creates lots of different definitions and creates kind of this suspicion towards definitions that you see in some of the communities. And saying, oh, you know, perhaps we don't need these definitions at all. And I say, no, actually we want definition, we still need definition. It's much better to argue about definitions, whether they are sufficient or not, do we like them or not, than to argue about systems. In some sense, we're kind of following uh, the lead of areas like cryptography. And we shouldn't even worry about the fact that we have lots of definitions. In cryptography, we do have lots of definitions for any particular task. And often, like just in fairness, they are contradicting each other but we understand them much better. So in some sense, this is our ideal, to come up with more definitions, but to understand them much better and to understand the relations much better and to have a better interface between society and this kind of different definition and see what do you want to use in every particular case. What are those definitions, some of these uh, tens or more of definitions? The most Popular of them are probably these notions of group fairness. And these kind of notions say that for a few uh, sets that are protected, perhaps defined uh, by ethnicity or gender, uh, we want to see the same treatment of this uh, protected set and the general population on average. Now, what, what does it mean the same behavior or the same treatment, uh, it can mean many things, and each one of these things will give us a different definition. So we can have notions like statistical parity. For example, when we're thinking about admission to university, statistical parity will say that we're admitting people from this protected set S with the same probability that we're admitting people from the general population. There can be same false positive, same false negative. There can be some notions of accuracy, the same level of accuracy, which is kind of calibration on the general population and your protected set. These definitions are very, very popular. Much of the research uh, is based on these definitions, even though we know their weakness for quite a while now. And so there Attractiveness is that they are very easy to work with, very easy to achieve, but they offer very weak protection, they're easy to abuse, and in fact, more and more research shows that they can even create some harm. So imposing them can create harm for the population you're trying to protect. And we've been aware of that for a while, but they are still very strong, and some, and in addition, these definitions are at odds with each other. You cannot get all of them. And usually at odds with utility to the point that you can't expect uh, companies or to, to adopt them because they would be shooting themselves, uh, their utility, uh, too strongly. Another question is, with these kind of definitions, you want to protect some sets. Which sets do you want to protect? Who are these S that you know you want to protect? Who decides? And this is an issue that has been discussed a lot in the social sciences, and it's well uh, understood that we don't really know what sets to protect. 
And in some cases, neither the majority knows to identify sets that require protections, or even the sets themselves, the individuals themselves, these communities themselves, are not aware that they need protection because they, in some sense they adopt the, the way the general population are looking at them. And putting it strongly than I ever did in a talk, though it's recorded, but in some sense one of the goals of, of theory in this area should be to try to retire these definitions as much as possible. And to do that, we need alternatives, and we need to understand these alternatives as best as we, we can. Uh, so perhaps we cannot hope to retire them immediately, but uh, some of the work in this area has been going towards that, and that's part of what I'm going to talk about, uh, or most of what I'm going to talk about in terms of technical details in this talk, with this goal. Questions? Right, so, so the point that, that Adi is making is that it's not always the case that we want for every set that needs protection, we want all of these properties. And for that reason, perhaps the fact that these definitions are at odds with each other is not such a big problem because sometimes they're at odds with each other at places where we don't want to adopt them. And, and the example you gave uh, is very good. So that you do, yeah, there are groups, but they perhaps they are not appropriate for this uh, setting. For example, young kids for admission to university. Uh, notions of uh, fairness do have to depend on the, on the context. So in the context of uh, admission to university, perhaps the group of 12-year-old of, uh, are not a protected set, should not be a protected set. But actually, I'm completely in agreement with you that not all of these notions always make sense. Yes, yeah, so, so there is notions of fairness. I mean, notions of fairness should apply everywhere. And in fact, this is part of the problem, but there is the, I mean, there is the object which is the risk cause that you're producing, but there is what we do with it. For example, perhaps we are ranking individuals with it, perhaps we are deciding admission based on it. So for each one of them, there could be a variant of these notions of fairness. And in fact, some of the things that we are looking into and need to address is composition of different, uh, so you can have various objects that each one of them looks fair or reasonable, and you compose them in a way that looks fair and reasonable, but the outcome, the entire system would not be very fair. So. Right, so, so, that's, yeah, so that's one of huge discussion. The question, could we, should we even use fairness in our, our terms when we talk about notions? Are we allowed to define X fairness, meaning fairness based on definition X at all? Should we even pronounce it? And there are very strong feelings that people say, you, you, you never should imply that you're creating fairness because nothing will ever be fair. Uh, and the, but somehow it's okay to say that you're reducing discrimination based on X. It's a huge kind of uh, debate, which I don't want to get into. Uh, uh, but yeah, I feel that it's important to identify the area, which is fairness. And in addition to uh, identify very clearly the technical notion that you, you care about. So I do like notions like metric fairness. Uh, but we should be very, very honest about what they provide and not provide. They will not provide fairness. There will not be a mathematical way to bypass society and say, okay, you do that, you have fairness. Right. 
so what so again uh, so what I want to provide is kind of an a array of different approaches which perhaps would be of, uh, appropriate in different cases perhaps in some cases uh, like perhaps loans if it's the bank and we don't want to impose something on them perhaps giving uh, all the loans for one group is okay perhaps not it's not so again the, the point is that there should be some involvement of policymakers, but between what policymakers think, what society think, and what translates to something that that can be, be can be used to develop algorithms or to verify that algorithms are doing what they want, there is a huge gap, and that's kind of what we want to address. We don't necessarily want to claim that uh, there is one definition that's appropriate in every given uh, case. So the first attempt at trying to break this notion of group fairness that are very, very uh, weak is this notion of individual fairness. That since then we, uh, we are calling it now, I think, metric fairness, or some of us are calling metric fairness, to be more specific. Uh, and that tries to formalize a notion that comes from, uh, from the legal arena that similar individuals should be treated similarly. And we want to give a mathematical way of, of understanding that and providing that. For that, we need some notion of similarity. What makes individuals similar or not? And this would be, again, depending on context. Uh, and this is this, uh, this um, similarity matrix. And given that you have a similarity matrix, you can say that the probability, for example, of seeing some event for individual x and for individual x prime should be bounded by their distance. Um, the probability that I will see an ad and the probability that somebody else would see it an ad can be either similar or dissimilar depending on whether we are similar or not. Uh, in this notion, a trivial solution uh, um, is to just give everybody the same treatment, to show everybody this, this ad with the same probability. And in some sense, what we want is subject to this fairness requirement to uh, optimize our utility, to do the best that we can under that. And this a kind of a metric is one way in which society can specify its preferences. These people that have uh, 0 0.8 or 0 0.9 probability of repaying a loan, in some contexts, they will be treated similarly. Society will decide we want to treat them similarly. In some other cases, they will be treated dissimilarly. But the point here is that here, we're not giving just this general protection for the entire uh, group. We're giving protections for individuals. Individuals are treated similarly to people that are similar to them. And again, it allows a society to specify pre uh, preferences. So this could be a way to address accuracy. So people that are very similar in some truth uh, way should be treated similarly, or perhaps it can uh, also uh, apply some refined affirmative action. So it's, it's society's place to have an impact. The challenge with this definition is this metric. Where does this metric come from? Uh, if you want to implement this metric fairness, the question, where does it come from? And uh, the point is that the metric, we can think about the metric as something objective that really tells us if individuals are similar or, or not. And this is really very hard to imagine where does this come from? But if we think about it as something that specifies society's uh, norms, it's much easier to think about something that is then up to debate uh, and it's public. So for example, credit scores and SAT scores are some kind of ways of defining if people are similar to each other or not. And they are constantly being reviewed and, uh, and debated and changed when society revises the way it looks at things. That's kind of the positive aspect of it. <clears throat> The 
What do you mean that the similarity is not transitive? Uh, do you have an example in mind? Right. Oh, right, but it's it's a quantitative measure. It's not a, it's not a qualitative measure. It, 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 sorry, it's quantitative. So, yeah. um, and where credit scores and SAT scores are a particular way of defining distances, but they are kind of limited. They are kind of linear. They are more sophisticated ways of defining. Uh, and I agree. I mean, but still, the challenge in this area adopting this definition is coming up with nuanced uh, and task-specific metrics and, and applying that. And this, there's been a lot of work just very recently about that, addressing it from various kinds of ways, uh, ways of eliciting the metric preferences for, uh, about the metric for individual. <coughs> Imagine policymakers, you can't expect them to actually give you an entire a similarity metric, but perhaps you can imagine them looking at particular, a few files and telling these are these individuals are similar, these individuals are not. So how do we combine that into an entire similarity metric and, and various other uh, things, like for example, adopting individual preferences, combining them. But there is another entire research area about that. <coughs> Right, so that's, that's another issue with this definition, the question of whether we're looking at fairness kind of a priori or a posteriori. Uh, does the fact that we were all given this, both given this loan with the same probability sufficient for us or not? Uh, again, all of these are uh, points of debate and, and can be appropriate in one case or not. This also can apply to resource allocation. So in other cases, it could be that you just get the same amount of resources. Um, but yeah, there are, if we only look at what happens after the fact, there could be a way to prove that something like this is just impossible, right? Because at some point there is a cutoff and somebody gets it or not. Okay. I want to talk about, so this has been for yeah, almost 10 years. It's 12, but just because it took us a while to get our paper accepted. Doesn't make it zero knowledge, but it's still a, a badge of honor. Oh, uh, was it, what was it? Not uh, no, the, uh, the earnest for awareness. It took, yeah, yeah. Yes, I, so we tried before, yeah. Thank you, ITC, yes. Okay. Here is a new uh, line of research that has been really active in the last two years and uh, that, that gives a completely different approach uh, to, uh, to fairness. And it's a very computational perspective and really something that I wouldn't imagine growing up even in uh, statistics, for example. And even in machine learning, there have been attempts that are similar but very, very different because of not adopting this computational perspective kind of trying to say theory as its, its, its role here. Often the weakness of group notions of fairness is that they do not protect important subgroups of the group you want to uh, protect. We had this example where you advertise a burger joint to vegetarian in the protected set and to a carnivores in the general population. So you do have statistical parity, you really uh, advertise with the same probability for people in the protected set and in the general population, but you are excluding the protected set because you are advertising to the wrong people in the protected set, to the vegetarians. Um, so in some sense, in this case, there is a subgroup that needs protection, which are the uh, carnivores of the protected set. But I'm not aware of any definition that would uh, define carnivores of any set as a protected set. I don't think that this was never done. Um, so fairness sometimes relies on identifying subgroups 
that are relevant for this particular task. Uh, the carnivores quali quali uh, qualified loan applicants. For example, if you give risk score, which is the average for everybody in a protected set, this would satisfy some kind of accuracy on the average, but would be very bad for the individuals that are more qualified than the average. This kind of line of research tries to protect every set, every subset that you can define, because we can't a priori know which sets need to be protected. What we try to do is protect every set that we can identify using some uh, limit on our compu computational resources. This is a place where we introduce into the fairness our understanding that we have some computational limitations. We're developing an algorithm with some computational limitation, and this has to be taken into account when we are looking at the definition of fairness. In some exact sense, it's going to be the best possible because if you cannot identify a set, you cannot protect it. And it also gives really a computational perspective on fairness, which I'll say a few more words after. Uh, and this protected has been proved very powerful in various settings with various goals. And again, we're not trying to say to society, you know, this is what you should care about, because in different cases, you may care about different things. In some cases, parity, statistical parity could make a sense. Some other cases, you want perhaps more emphasis on accuracy. And so let me say a little bit more about this notion. One of these variants of this notion, as I said, it was applied in different uh, settings. So here we're looking at the pipeline of producing a, of machine learning, where you have the data, based on it you learn some predictor, and then you're applying the predictors to predict. And there could be biases introduced in every step of this uh, pipeline, starting with the gathering of data. And I'll say something about it, hopefully. Uh, but here, what we're trying to do in this particular definition is just make sure that the learning itself doesn't introduce additional uh, biases. You want to be as accurate as the learning allows you and as the data and your computational resources allow you to be. I'll give you an example where this makes sense. As I said, different contexts require different things. So this is ageism in healthcare. Certain diseases in elderly population is, goes underdiagnosed. And the reason is that it is masked by age-related symptoms. You go to your physician, you say, oh, you know, this hurts, this hurts, this is what I feel. And say, you know, it's, you're not getting any younger. This is uh, appropriate for people your age, go away. And that's how kind of uh, it goes. And, and this is a form of discrimination. The risk is that machine learning will take decisions of physicians and would amplify these kind of biases because there will be more to gain from becoming very, very good in identifying diseases on young uh, population than on the elderly. But on the other hand, we don't want to overcorrect. This is one case where statistical parity doesn't make any sense uh, because sometimes these are age-related issues. So you don't want to force the physician to uh, diagnose people in the elderly population with the same probability that they diagnose uh, with younger population. And you don't want to create unnecessary tests and treatments. So this is one case where accuracy is a form of uh, protection. Uh, so here we want to be as accurate as the computational resources permit. I'll just say that once you have that, you can then impose uh, social norms and correct biases uh, because in some sense it's good to know what the world as it is is actually is before you want to correct it. There are some ways in which we're trying to impose uh, um, social norms but without understanding reality as it is, this will be very blunt. So trying to get something that's as accurate as possible before you try to correct it still makes sense. Uh, I don't know how much time do we have. 10 minutes, OK. Perhaps I would skip the formal thing. 12 minutes, OK. So I can tell you whatever. You, now I can tell you whatever you want to know. Uh, let me kind of 
very, keep it at a very high level, uh, you have a population and you want to create this predictor and you want to compare it to this kind of ideal predictor, this P star, which is the actual probability of the event. And we said that we actually don't know what this P star means, what our individual probabilities mean. And so there is no way in which we can hope to be individually accurate because this is just not defined. Uh, and let me just say that why do computation come into, into play here? So if we want to approximate the real probability scores, uh, we know that we cannot be individually uh, ac accurate because we never see these probabilities. We only see individuals for which the event happened and individuals for which the event didn't happen. We can't really even learn that. Uh, but any accuracy that you can hope for will depend on computational hardness. Because it could be the case that everybody has a bit kind of on their forehead or somehow implanted in, their, in themselves that tells them if the event is going to happen or not. But if we cannot access these bits, uh, because, for example, this is the sets, the ones and the zeros are pseudo-random, or indistinguishable from random, or perhaps they are random, then this picture will be indistinguishable from a picture where every individual has probability half of, of this event happening. So in this case, where this kind of thing is completely random, given perhaps your data, is indistinguishable from the case where everybody is half, and you cannot expect to be accurate there. But what we want is that for every set that we do, that we are able to put our hands on, uh, we want accuracy on protection for these sets. This is why computational hardness comes into play. You have to take it into account. So, multi-calibration and, and multi-accuracy essentially says that you take a large collection of sets defined by some measure of your computational power. All the sets that can be described with a circuit of some size or with a conjunction of some variables or with a decision list of some depth. And for every such set, you want the same property we once asked for only a few sets, a few protected sets. For example, here, in this notion, we want accuracy. We want for, for that for every set here, uh, you want that in expectation you're giving the right predictions. This was very weak when we only ask it for the entire population. But if we identify these sub-communities that, that are special for this classification, then this can be very powerful. There is multi-calibration is just a stronger notion of accuracy and perhaps I'll skip it. Um, As I focus on the definitions, perhaps I'll skip that as well. I just want to say that the techniques of uh, optimizations and machine learning, so techniques that they like a lot already, do help us provide ways of obtaining this kind of definitions. It's nice to have a definition and to ask protections for a huge amount of sets, but if then you cannot get it, or it's impossible, then it doesn't help. What we can show is that there are predictors that are multi-calibrated even for very large collections of sets, and they are not very complicated, and something about the complexity of obtaining them. Furthermore, perhaps from a practical point of view, it's very important that we're not telling uh, companies to, to abandon their favorite ways of learning, their deep learning uh, networks, and just adopt our algorithm we can impose our approaches as a post-processing. So do whatever you want, and we'll help you improve it. Lots of related work, different contexts, for example, imposing statistical parity for many sets, uh, and um, I, I would not have time to explain all that. I want to say that this gives some perspective kind of to revisit this notion of individual probabilities. So if we assign probabilities uh, based on a multi-accurate or multi-calibrated predictor, 
And then in some concrete way, we are consistent with the evidence that is ahead in front of us. Perhaps with lots of expectations that we got from various uh, kind of medical experiments. We protect against systemic uh, discrimination. Perhaps we don't have individual accuracy, but we are protecting lots of subgroups that are relevant. And in some sense, we are indistinguishable from this P star. Imagine this story with the, with the physician. You go to the physician and they, gave, uh, they give you some probability. And let's not think about one individual. This happens again and again and again and again. And then we see what happened to these individuals. And now a committee looks and tries to evaluate the success of this, of this uh, physician. Looks at all of, this, this, all of these probabilities and what happened at the end. And tries to determine, was this physician uh, saying things that are consistent with what happened? If you are multi-calibrated or uh, multi-accurate, then yes, you will not be able to distinguish between uh, um, whatever the world has to, to offer you and the case where actually the outcomes were sampled exactly based on, the, on what the physician told you. So it could be that we have in our mind something that's very, very different than the actually what, what's true but we will never be able to, to, to understand that our model is not correct. There's many interesting questions like uh, how to uh, choose multi-calibrated predictors among a variety of those. How to know, we said, okay, you want to be as accurate as the data and computational resources allow you. How can we say that perhaps they don't allow us to be fair enough? Perhaps our data is faulty to to an extent that just doesn't facilitate uh, fairness, and we can just we should just abandon this uh, task of uh, of, um, of classification altogether because we cannot be fair. I just say that in this area because and I'll skip it because this is such a vibrant area and and there is a need for algorithms that are uh, fair. There is a much shorter time between a theory and actually implementations of some of these ideas have already dem been demonstrated in, in experimental work and I think that they already, we have some evidence that they're already being adopted by companies. Let me skip that. Um, okay. How much time do I have, if at all? Three minutes and a half. So I have half a minute for each one of these other directions, <laughs> other things. Already lots of interesting work for all of these other things, but um, still tons of interesting things to work. So first, beyond idealized uh, data. Data can be faulty for various reasons. We can have a biased sample that perhaps undersample individuals from a particular population, perhaps because we didn't give them loans in the past, so we don't have in our data how do they, to what extent do they repay a loan or not? It can be, we can have biased labels, uh, and we can have missing attributes. For example, AP scores, one of the favorite examples of, of our colleague Cynthia at work, is schools that don't offer AP classes. So for individuals from populations that go to these schools, we are missing a very important attribute that helps discriminate between the stronger population and the weaker, and, and these individuals are in a situation that's much worse towards admission to university. In some cases, we just have, don't have attributes, and one thing that we're trying to do is to A, identify that we don't have enough good, that our attributes are not good enough. And this could be formalized in different ways, for example, by seeing that in particular population, our predictions are too uh, uniform. If we believe that there is talent everywhere, then we do expect to find a different uh, classification within every community that, that, that we can think of that's not exactly uh, associated with those that are just uh, not consistent with our task. But one, with, beyond simple, single components, composition is very hard. Composition was 
a major theme in cryptography for decades, and I think it will be a major theme within fairness for a while. Things that seem reasonable when they compose can create things that look very unfair. That is beyond static decisions. A decision that you make now affect reality in the future. You create incentives, you create uh, different behaviors. If you accept people for your university with, from a community that has not been put, uh, accepted in the past, you will create better candidates from this population down the stream. So how do you take this into account beyond the kind of examples that algorithms do so many things, we want all of these things that they do to be fair, and this creates different uh, uh, challenges when you talk about ra rankings or even things that go beyond. Uh, beyond cooperative agents, agents do have, uh, uh, we, we need to look at the incentives, the game theory aspect of our work, uh, or the cryptographic aspect of our work, which is dealing with malicious agents, perhaps are trying to discriminate. How can we let them prove that they are not discriminating? And beyond CS, for example, compatibility with the law that Chaffee talked a lot about, uh, or interfacing with policymakers. Eventually, we need a way for policymakers to make decisions that really translate to something very concrete. Um, so, conclusions. The theory offers uh, alternatives to group fairness that I would call broken or mostly broken. There's still more to, to be done in each one of those for us to really be able to say that we have alternatives and, and that are strong enough for the entire research community and industry to, to abandon those notions and go forward with our notions. In general, the computational aspect of definitions have to be taken into account. All these players are computationally bounded and we need to understand that. The learners, the hypothesis they produce, the auditors that try to identify unfairness. Um, and finally, this is a very exciting time to do uh, this kind of work within TOC. Uh, involves many sub areas. We need expertise that are very wide uh, and lots of very fundamental questions are unanswered. So it's kind of reminiscent of some of the exciting times in theory in other areas that we've seen in the past. You can be part of it really at, at, at the bottom if you join us now. Thank you.